It's too large of a group for introductions. I wouldn't mind doing them, but okay, we're not going to be able to with this many people, which is a good thing. And there's a lot of interest. But I would like to get a little more from you guys um, in terms of who you are. So I'm going to try to do it as a group. How many students do we have here? <whistles> wow. All right. And uh, students at FIU? Most of you? Um, others that aren't from FIU, where are you from? UM? UM? Okay. We're from Toronto Optimus Club. All right. Palo Alto University. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, most of you in PhD programs? No. No? Where else? <laughs> <laughs> what are you in? Yeah. Master's program. Master's in? in licensed mental health counseling. Okay, okay. MHC, good. Okay. Uh, school psychology. Okay. Psyche. Okay. So we got PsyD, PhD, Masters. Any MFT candidates? MSW? Okay. So for those of you who are not students, uh, how many PhDs or PsyDs do we have in here? Okay. Oh, there's a challenge. Always a challenge. Like where, where to deliver a, a speech or a, you know, a workshop. Uh, that's quite a bit of range. Um, we'll make it work. Uh, when you, whenever you kind of start this kind of workshop type of format, I always like to think of it as really much more of a roll up your sleeves and, and practice stuff and try to do something rather than simply talk about it. Um, in some ways that ends up, you know, having a mixed group like this, it means you have to deliver things at a couple of levels. Um, so for those of you who are experienced family therapists who have kind of been around the block around some of this stuff, I'll apologize in advance if some of it seems to be much more at a, a, a level of introduction. Um, but let's see as we go forward about kind of raising the bar because it's a pretty bright group in here. And so I think we can probably tolerate raising the bar pretty high as we move forward. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about um, you know, definitions of techniques. I'll do a little bit of that um, later on in the presentation. But I'm thinking that the structure for this, um, we'll talk a little bit about engagement for the first part of it, um, and then talk a little bit about principles. And the big principles I want to focus on are strength-based and relational. And kind of close down uh, with a break. Um, and maybe starting the, right before we do the break, have you guys come together in, in breakout groups um, to get things ready. And then when we come back, we'll, we'll follow through with the breakouts um, and talk about what it means to be strength-based and relational. Then we'll come back and talk about principles and techniques of motivating families into a change process. And then watch a little bit of video. Depending on how much of the video I show um, will depend on how far we get when we talk about actually change itself. So I'm thinking about this in really kind of three steps. There's an engagement process to get families in the door or get you in their door. Then there's a motivation piece is now that you got them there, how do you go from that superficial getting them there to depth of connecting with them. And then once you actually have them hooked and wanting to change, wanting to try something new, what the hell do you do? Um, the what the hell you do piece is actually the easy part, believe it or not. Um, the, the harder parts are the getting in the door and actually motivating them to change. So we'll spend a little bit more time on that. And honestly, I will not be upset if we don't get to the third piece of that. You know, it's fine. If the, if the level of the conversation keeps us focused on the motivation piece, that's outstanding. And if you want to see more of the videotape, that's also fine. It's an old tape. Tape is much more exciting to watch than, than actually, you know, just listening to another lecture, especially at the end of a conference on a Friday afternoon. You know, try to at least hook you around that. Fair enough? Okay. Does that inconsistent with anything you guys kind of expected or were hoping to get coming in? Would you want something else? I am very easy. Yeah. All right. Um, also, as an evidence-based person, an hour and 20, hour and 30 minutes is a long time to go sitting in a room. If you guys need to stand up, walk out, um, you know, that's fine. You're not going to offend me. Unless you're screaming, going, this is all BS. You know, that might offend me. Um, but you know, if you need to get up and move around, that's fine also. Um, just go ahead and, you know, take a break as you see fit. And we might take extra breaks, too, depending on how things are going. Ah, so I already talked a lot about these kids, the ones we're working with. Um, 
the, the families we're going to be talking about engaging and motivating um, tend not to be very motivated to seek out services. In fact, they're, it's not just unmotivated, they're pretty much anti-motivated to be involved. They typically are not self-referrals. Most of the families we're talking about working with have been referred from the school system or the juvenile justice system or the child welfare system. Their parents oftentimes have a very different view of what they want to see done than what it is you would like to see as a family therapist. And so they're also not highly motivated to be involved in a process. In fact, they're anti-motivated oftentimes themselves. This isn't my issue, this is him. And so their idea of seeking help, even though it might be really nice and not with all the negativity and blame, often ends up being much more kid-centric. And so we have to think about right out of the gate, how do we create a frame that's helpful for engaging the kids and families we're working with? How many of you guys are planning on or are currently doing clinical work uh, in private practice or in real world settings right now? Okay. How many of you are in private practice? different set of challenges there because oftentimes in private practice some of the stuff we're going to be talking about looks a little bit different than if you're doing kind of front-end services as part of uh, contracts with a state um, or a Department of Juvenile Justice type of provider. So a lot of what I'm going to end up saying has to do with what, what it takes to actually get kids that are being referred typically into agencies um, that have a contract from either a local or a state level agency that's saying these kids need services and it's your job to get it to them. Um, so some of this might not be as relevant for those of you who are in the private practice setting. When we get to the motivation, some of that will kick in. But I can be educated because I think there are a lot of real interesting things that go on in private practice to make sure people are showing up that look just a little bit different. So I'd be curious to hear your guys' interpretations as we go about how that works with what you're doing and to hear you sharing that as we go. There's a, a, a real challenge in getting these kids to come in. Um, so I think one of the first things to think about is reconceptualizing the problem. Typically when you talk about families that don't show up for services, the, they often get referred to as being resistant, um, being part of the problem. And so in family therapy, one of the principles um, that cuts across almost all the programs is that resistance is not something we talk about. We don't see the problem as something that's client-based. We see the problem as being something that exists in the way we approach and interact with families. So it puts everything, in terms of the burden of responsibility, on us rather than on the family. It's up to us to adjust our behavior to match to them rather than thinking about them as being resistant clients. So from a principal perspective, one of the things we can control, presumably, is our own behavior. And so what we ask is that therapists really engage in an exploration of what do I need to do to effectively engage this family into services? How do I adjust my behavior based on typically a very superficial understanding of what might be going on with that family? Oftentimes we pick up a referral. That referral might include name, number, reason for referral, and a few other pieces of information, and that's all we get. Other times you get about 30 pages of an assessment that's been done, um, and you'd have to sort through what's relevant as you're walking in to talk to them. But at that point, they don't know you guys at all. No contact with you whatsoever, and everything you've learned from them is in a, on a piece of paper that comes from an assessment report or somebody else's impression of them. You need to be making up your mind immediately about what I can do as a therapist at the most superficial of levels to match to the families that I'm going to be calling. How do I present myself? How do I refer to myself? How do I refer to what it is I'm going to be doing? Do I use the term therapy? Do I use the term counseling? Do I use the term doctor? Do I use the term Mr. Mrs.? Do I refer to them as Mr. or Mrs.? How are you going to approach all of those things up front? We'll get it wrong sometimes. But based on your understanding of the population you're working with, you're going to start making those decisions right up front. If you're doing work in an agency, um, uh, do you have a, a clinic or an office where you have adults and children coming in? 
who the adult population you're working with. If you have a heavily um, drug-involved adult population you're doing work with, and you're trying to serve young fam you know, uh, families with young children, it can be pretty intimidating for families as they're coming into a waiting room. How are you going to manage things in the waiting room to make sure that their impression of you, because at this point, it's all superficial for them also, their impression of you is maximized in terms of their expectation that you're a credible helper and you're going to be responsive to their needs. So start thinking this through from the very beginning because engagement is a tricky beast and so much of it occurs in that first moments where you're reaching out. <clears throat> so in terms of getting kids and families into treatment, we, we operate from a few basic principles. Number one is timely. We want to send the message to the families that what they're, the problems they're struggling with, we respect them and we want to get in the door fast. This is an issue for them. It's a big issue. Whether they see it as an issue or not, we're going to send the message immediately that we want to work with you and we want to work with you right now. We have rules of thumb in FFT of within 24 hours of receiving a referral, we expect you to be in contact with that referral. If you haven't reached out within 24 hours, you're sending them the message that they don't matter. Within four days, we would like to have a session scheduled. Within 10 days, we want that session conducted. If we can actually get that session conducted within five or six, fantastic. But we're not going to just sacrifice who needs to be there, getting the right people there, for time. If it takes longer to get the right people there, we will take longer to get the right people there. Bless you. It can take 20 to 30 contacts with somebody in a four-day period to get them to the first session. There's a fine line between stalking and being competent professionals. Um, but we go after them, and pretty intensively. We'll go after them at home. We'll go after them at schools. We'll go after them on street corners. And we'll try it multiple times during the day. By far, the thing we use the most is telephone calls. Telephone calls at multiple times during the day in multiple locations, always being respectful of where they are at. If they're at work, if they're at school, how you present yourself is really critical because you don't want to put them in a place where they feel awkward. But expect a lot of work. So timeliness and frequency. Use your relationship with your referral sources. I'm kind of going quick through here, just the principal piece, because I want to get more into the nuts and bolts in a minute. You've got to work with your referral sources closely. If you're working as a family therapist and the referral source is making that referral to you and they have no sense that the whole family needs to be seen, you're already one step behind where you need to be. If the referral source is able to talk about your work in an effective way, they're able to talk you up and to give the family a sense of what to expect, your job is made so much easier. That is not an easy thing to accomplish though. Referral sources don't like being told what to do, how to do their job. Talking to a school counselor or to a probation officer is not an easy thing in a, lot of, in a lot of contexts. And you actually have to earn your credibility with them typically. It usually takes time with your picking up some of their cases and doing well for them to trust you enough to actually start pitching you to the families that, are, that they're working with and they're sending to you. It's not uncommon for us to pick up a referral and have therapists to immediately call the family without ever checking with the referral source. Big problem. Whenever you pick up that referral, you should be reaching back to the referral source. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Over the course of treatment, you should be checking in with that referral source. And at the end of treatment, you should be checking in with the referral source again. You got to close that deal all the way throughout with your cases so that the expectations and your credibility is not just with the family, but it's with the systems you're working with. And that's going to lead to your successful engagement with your next cases, maybe not the first ones. But it takes some time to think that through. I'm just kind of giving you the general principles and we'll kind of get a little more into it in a second. And last one on this one, um, when you're working with the referral sources, work hard to support common goals. You don't need to pander to them. <laughs> you don't need to convince them of the rightness of what it is you're trying to accomplish. Um, find out what they're interested in seeing changing with the family. 
and help them understand how you're going to help, how you're going to make that happen. You don't need to come in, oh, what I'm going to do is, you know, this kid, that poor guy, you know, he's showing up now in, this, in the juvenile justice system because he just hasn't, she hasn't had enough love. Mom and dad are doing this. So, you know, I've been working hard on trying to reframe it so everyone sees him as, in a much more positive way. The judge doesn't care about that. The probation officers don't care about that. You've got to speak their language. Teachers don't care about that. They want to hear. Is he going to come to school? Is he going to get his work done? Is he going to stop being such a problem in school? Is mom going to be involved for a change? Probation officer, is he going to show up at his damn appointments? Am I going to have to keep dealing with dirty urine screens? How can I get him off probation? Those are the types of things they're interested in hearing from you about how you're going to help work on those common goals. And when you're doing work with the types of families we're talking about, that's the bottom line. Better communication is great. Better problem solving skills, communication training skills, all great. No problem there. But that's not the prize. We want to see reductions in the behavior problems. We want to see improved school attendance and performance. Those are the things we're looking for. And that's okay to really focus in on those common goals with your referral sources. Engagement doesn't start with your reach out to the family. Engagement starts with the, the referral source talking about you in a positive way and in a way that's consistent with how you're going to work. It starts before you're even in the picture. If you can really have an influence on that process, your life will be a hell of a lot easier. And those same principles apply in private practice and in any of the community-based work. Um, provide data where you can. Don't just make this about like the one case. People love stories. Um, but over time, if that's all you got, um, it's hard to influence some of the stakeholders. So don't be afraid to really show them, hey, you know, you, you've sent me eight cases. I really appreciate it. And we were able to complete seven of those eight kids. I don't know how that stacks up with, you know, what's, you know how, how other folks have done. Um, but I really want to make sure that we're able to continue this. It seems like a real nice collaboration. However, you're pre you know, presenting this seems to be working effectively. Or you know what? You've sent me five cases, and it's been a real struggle on our end. We've only got one of them through. Um, been pretty tough sledding on, on the others. Maybe there, there are things that we can do to work it out together so we can actually have a better success rate. Being willing to go to them and have a conversation about, about the data and about the cases. See, I'm talking about data broadly here, not about an evaluation, but about experience that you have in working with each of the people in the community. Um, <clears throat> That's good enough for now. Um, well, I, let me see if I've got something here in terms of more depth. I will mention one other thing here. Um, the coordination of services is really important um, and thinking through the systems involvement. Remember my little hypnotizing slide in the morning with all the things spinning? Um, when you think about the different systems that kids are involved with, who do you think you need to reach out to at some point in the treatment process to make sure you're on the same page with them? Put that in mind very early in the process and get the family's permission to do those reach outs. Um, you can do it with a referral source before you've seen them because they're sending you that referral so you can actually talk to them beforehand. But once you've got that family and you're connecting with them, any other conversations, you need their approval. If you have a kid who's not showing up to school and is using substances and you're focused on substance use and you don't pay attention to the school system, you could run into problems. Uh, completely unanticipated, um, might, be, might even be for all the, the, the right reasons that bad things happen, but I'll give you an example. We, we're doing a project in New Mexico um, where we're, we're uh, crossing contingency management with uh, evidence-based group therapy and evidence-based FFT. And in that study, the CM procedure, the contingency management procedure, involves um, providing a financial, monetary reimbursement for a clean urine. And so if the kid comes in and they test clean and they report they haven't used and their parent says they haven't used, they get a monetary reward. There's a whole business called C, uh, the CT payer cards. There's clinical trials credit cards that people, you know, so we have a little credit card so they, they can't just go and use cash for more drugs, but it gives them a little credit card that they can use and take it out to, you know, wherever a credit card accept, is accepted. 
the kids can earn $540 over 14 weeks for 14 consecutive year in screens. It's a lot of money. That's a lot of money for a 13, 14, 15 year old. So the stakes are really high. This comes from the drug abuse treatment literature for adults and heavy drug users uh, for motivational enhancement therapy. Motiv um, this whole idea about paying um, uh, opiate users for sobriety. And there, the stakes are around $1,200 for a course of treatment. So we actually cut it in half in this study, but we didn't want to have it be so small that it was because the incentive was too small. We wanted to see if the incentive still made a difference. We get one kid who is clean. He shows up seven straight weeks, has not gone to school for two months. He shows up seven straight weeks to treatment and he's clean. This kid is a multi-drug using kid, has been clean all seven weeks, goes to school one day. School suspends him that afternoon, it puts him in, in uh, detention after school detention for not showing up to school for the two months before. He misses his therapy session, which means it cuts off his earning potential immediately. And so we did not do our job in making sure we were coordinating with the school about this kid's treatment to prevent that from occurring. If we had been talking to the school about placement and other issues, we could have avoided the whole problem. Of course, we, we adjusted and all the rest of it, and we learned what happened, and the kid got back onto his track. But this is a big problem and a hiccup in treatment when you're not paying attention to systems that need to be involved. And so this, this is not just about engaging up front. It's about engaging throughout the treatment process. When you can manage those seams effectively, the experience is just so much better for the families. And ultimately, it's so much easier for you. Um, we see this with prob probation violations, and we see this with substance abuse treatment that often runs corollary with FFT and other treatment models. Oftentimes in community settings, the kids get a shotgun approach for services. They're going to offer about 15 different things, and, and family therapy is just one of them. And so the kids in their own substance use treatment, and they end up testing um, positive, and they get kicked out of substance use treatment. It just perplexes me why you get kicked out of treatment for the problem that you're exhibiting in treatments. Like, isn't that what you're supposed to be addressing for them, not kicking them out of it for it? And so working with the judges, working with the probation officers to make sure that a probation violation does not lead to that kid further a kid's further penetration of the system. They let treatment have enough time to work. And that means that the probation workers have to trust you and have to trust your method and believe that what you're going to be doing is going to have an impact. And that doesn't occur through praying that, it hurt, that it's going to happen. It occurs through hard work and conversations. So I can't sell that hard enough to you guys. We spend hours on this in, a, in our trainings with our, with our therapist, and we actually don't start with it. We, uh, we lead with other pieces and then come back to it, because this work is even harder to do than some of the other work with the families. I think part of what has to happen, I'm not a clinician, I'm a school administrator that just opened a new program in the district, having been a principal at a site for students with emotional behavior disabilities for 11 years. So surrounded by the issues, <coughs> the key is that strong relationship between the clinician, the multi-team approach, it has to be. Yeah. It's not going to be the school counselors, they don't have time to do any of this yeah. that you're talking about. They're supposed to, but they, they just don't do it, right. it's, not, it's not reality. So that relationship is vital, and that surprise factor. What happened with me is I didn't care. The more therapy, the better. But that was my philosophy. Yeah. Because I couldn't get to the real issues, because when we close our doors at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock, we're done. We yeah. get paid every 15 days. We, we know we're fine. Mm -hmm. this is, we work for the state. No one's going to fire us ever, regardless <laughs> of what we do. Um, <laughs> or not. So, so realistic. It is. But we need, so we need the clinicians yeah. to prove themselves yeah. in, 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 in delivering. And, and in doing that piece because that's the only solution to mm -hmm. the future of, of what we ever want to do if we're going to impact yeah. society, especially in a, yeah. in a large urban district like we are. in South Florida is a perfect place to do this. Mm -hmm. just trying to recruit people to come to work for us that have the heart for the work because what happens is that we burn out then, you know, we have social workers. They don't do social work. They do paperwork to comply. For, so then maybe mm -hmm. these kids can qualify for IEP so maybe we can get more funding so maybe 
So it becomes something else completely. So clinicians have to take the work very seriously and they have to develop these strong relationships with the principals, mm -hmm. the assistant principals, the counselors, whatever the team is. Yeah. Uh, and, and do the research and find out. And family engagement in another area completely. I've been studying some of the stuff that's coming out of Harvard, John Hopkins. Families want to, they don't want you to tell them what they don't know how to do. They want you to listen to what they need, what's, what's in their interest. And it's attendance, it's mm -hmm. I want my kid in school, mm -hmm. I don't want him to be excluded anymore, suspensions, you know, all those things that we keep doing, we keep excluding kids from schools, which yeah. absurd. Yeah. But those are the issues that I think we have to deal with, mm -hmm. and then working together is the only way we're going to have, we're going to make a dent in anything clinical or, or, or attendance, and you know, what's in it for me as a, as a district, as a school? Well, you'll get your kids to come to school every day. That's more funding, right? So you have to find that value, mm -hmm. build the relationship, and work at it. It just doesn't happen yeah. magically. Yeah. So praying is good. Yeah. I like it. But that doesn't solve <laughs> all the problems. <laughs> uh, you should be up here side by side presenting this part of it with me. Actually, yeah. you couldn't have said it better. Um, and, and I like the way you, you brought in the you know kids showing up to school is more money to the school. Um, how many of you guys get the call from the school? Not you young ones, I'm sorry. Um, how many of you guys get the calls from the school where they go, you know, next week they're taking the census, so better make sure your kid is at school this week. It's like, really? You know, you're going to tell me this is the middle of the school? Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, get them on the bus. We, you know, we know about the bus, too. Uh, money drives a lot of this. And money to a principal, that's a different story than the teacher who's in the classroom having to put up with this kid's crap every single day. And so at, at the levels, you think about who are you tailoring your conversation to. And that's a big one. If the kids are showing up and they're involved in the classroom and it's not disruptive, that's a win all the way around. And you have credibility. Probation officers can be a pain in the butt. Uh, but probation officers can be, how many of you are probation officers? I shouldn't even say that because some of my best friends are probation officers. Yeah. Okay. None of them are, given that we have no probation officers in here. Now, probation officers are, are great um, and can be your, your ally in all of this when you are able to convince them you're going to help towards the common goals. We actually have an adaptation of functional family therapy called Functional Family Probation Services, and we train case managers and probation workers in a relationship-based style of influencing people rather than a punitive-based style of influencing people. And we've, we've actually trained um, hundreds of, of probation workers here in the U.S. And we retrained the entire system of case managers in the Netherlands. So over 540 case managers there to actually stop being punitive uh, and blame focused and actually be much more geared towards the relationship and being strength based. And you can get kids to show up to their appointments. They actually don't run away from you when you're walking in the door. When they're treated with respect and you actually hear what their needs are and you work towards that common goal. That's not easy to do though. How you demonstrate respect with people that are at war with one another is a complicated process. And we'll get to that part. Um, thank you for the comment, I appreciate it. So speed and flexibility we've talked about, speed and availability we've talked about. Well, we talked about speed, we didn't talk about availability. Let's talk about availability for a little bit. If you're going to work with disenfranchised inner city poor families, you can't do it from nine to five. So there does require some flexibility in when you're available. So that puts burden and stress on clinicians because you don't want to also give up your life. So teams need to think about how they're organized to do this work. Because if you're giving up four or five nights a week, and you're giving up some of your weekend, your burnout rate um, is going to be very, very, very short. You're going to burn out fast. That candle's going to be gone within a year or two. The turnover rate for a lot of the therapists in these inner city agencies is around a year and a half to two years. They're in and they're gone. Fast food workers, uh, my colleague from the UM just told me, fast food, fast food workers and therapists have about the same life expectancy in their jobs. That's pretty terrifying. So flexibility and persistence. So availability, when you do services, also refers to where you do services. Uh, my perspective on this and a lot of the, the evidence-based models is location of services should not be the obstacle to a family receiving the service. So if we can open things up to meet families 
at a place that's convenient for them, we're going to actually get a lot more of them in the door. Don't know which door it's going to be, their door, or somebody, or somewhere else, a church, a school, a library. I've seen therapy be done in park benches, um, and a lot of it is being done in families' homes now. Some families don't want you there, um, but most of them are actually okay with it. Flexibility and, and persistence is critical. Um, again, this is the stocking piece about it. Um, when somebody says, can we give up on this case and pick up the next one on our, on, on our list? Um, did you call the contact person? How often did you call them? When did you call them? Um, did, what did you say on the messages to them? Did you do <laughs> random drive-by, the drive-by therapies? Um, did you go by their house? What time did you go by their house? Did you try it multiple times? Did you try them at work on other numbers? So we're going to go through all of this. Did you send a letter? After I hear all of this, okay, maybe you can drop that case and move on. It's different. It's different than if you are relying, in terms of your livelihood, on making sure you're delivering a certain number of hours so you get reimbursed for it. And those are just realities in the work. And so some, some places you just don't have that kind of flexibility. So you better have a large number of referrals that are coming in if these are the types of kids you're working with so you can meet those hours because a lot of the families need that flexibility and persistence. And it is borderline stocking. We don't give up. We treat it like a public health issue rather than just trying to uh, have a family get the mental health services they need. We go after every single family as if it's a public health issue. <clears throat> If you can get your foot in the door fast, um, there's great outcomes long term. We were able to, in Florida, we were able to reduce the length of time between the initial referral and our initial contact to be within two days, and to reduce the time from the initial referral to the first session to less than six days. As we did that, we were able to see that the length of service went from about six months to around three months over time. We were able to move from around eight sessions per family to around 12 sessions per family. And we were able to reduce the recidivism rates down from 45% to around 17 or 18%. We got to a place where we could no longer discrimi discriminate our outcomes, recidivism or no recidivism, based on program parameters, based on length of service, based on all of those types of things. It was purely around what I think at that point were clinical issues where ther the therapist needed better supervision, better guidance to help them be more effective. That's, of course, operating in my naive view that, that family therapy is a panacea that will fix everything. The reality is it's not. It's not a magic pill. It's not a magic wand. It's not going to solve all the problems of the world. You're still going to be, with the kids we're talking about here, your best work with the deepest end kids probably one out of every three is going to fail. That's the reality. Tough business we're in. You guys are all a little bit masochistic for choosing it. Those are Hall of Fame numbers in baseball. But when you're developing relationships with people and you're that close to them, that's tough. That's why burnout's high. Um, I just said location and time shouldn't be an obstacle. Um, a little bit of adjusting time and methods. Uh, uh, I mentioned that in terms of drive-bys, letters, leaving, f leaving messages, um, and also um, this notion of uh, uh, making sure that you try a bunch of different avenues before you say enough is enough. Um, <clears throat> your initial presentation matters in how you approach families. Um, how many of you guys uh, make a telephone call to the family before, to, a, to a contact person before your first session? Get them up there higher. Okay. <laughs> How many of you guys uh, rely on an intake staff to set up your first session? Okay, so a few. All right. Okay. Um, how many of those people, when you're reaching out to them, for, the, for those of you who said you do your calls yourself, how many of you them would, would I'm just going to say on average, how often is that person a female caregiver? Most of the time? Okay. I didn't ask you a yes or no question. It's like, where the hell do you put your arm? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, it's, it's typically a female caregiver that that's the first one we, we contact. What do you say? How do you start that conversation? Anyone? Bueller? <laughs> Bueller? Go for it. I love it. No, it's not a good time for me, Liz, from blank. <laughs> and um, I'm just letting you know I'm calling you because I got the referral from the Juvenile Services Department. Then uh, when is it a good time for me to call you back? Excellent. <laughs> Introduce yourself. Be nice. Be clear. Yeah. Here I am. Right? Yeah. So, again, Liz Apano, how would you say your last name? Salido. Oh, I didn't even come close. Yeah. I'm blind and deaf. Yeah, <laughs> I've got that going for me. Okay. Um, one adjustment is all. Don't give them an out. If you give them an out, they'll take it. So I'm so-and-so. I was given your name by the Juvenile Services Department. Um, I know it might not be a good time. I'll only take a couple minutes of it. I'm sure you're pretty busy. Were you aware that I was going to be giving you a call, or is this completely out of the blue? Um, so you just start it and start moving fast um, because you don't have a lot of time with them. But you don't want to give them an out. And so if you tell a kid, I just need five minutes of your time, that's all you're going to get. If you tell a kid in a therapy session, you know, we just need to go for 15 minutes. If I get good 15 good minutes out of you, that's all we'll need here in therapy. Most of them will hold you to that 15 minute deadline through the rest of therapy. And so you don't want to negotiate yourself out of your position. Your, your tone, your clarity, I love it. It's spot on. That's exactly the way to start a, a call. It's not magic. This is not rocket science. But it's not easy work. You have to really rapidly be able to show I'm respecting your position. I'm not coming in as an expert, which you did not come in as an expert at all. You were very much around a relationship. Um, you want to come in even at times one down. Um, without giving up your power. We'll talk a little bit about what that looks like when we talk about respect-based and relational. Um, and you want to start thinking through from the very beginning, I need to start building a relationship sequentially here with the family. I don't have access to everybody simultaneously. What does this person need to hear from me right now to feel heard and understood and that maybe this person is credible to help me with my goals? Not necessarily my family. We don't know that one yet. But we're okay with trying to get that hook into them. A little bit of a big borrowing and stealing so they get the impression, you know what, this, this person can help me get my goals met. For a kid, that might be getting people off of my back. So she might say, you know what, I had no idea that you were going to be calling me. This is completely out of the blue. Um, that's disappointing. I'm sorry to hear that because I did receive the referral, and that's got to be tough. Um, has this happened to you before where things are just kind of happening, they're kind of more out of your control, and strange people like me are giving you a call? Um, so quickly kind of making that adjustment to what's happening. So you're demonstrating respect, meeting her where, it's, where they're at, and building a relationship with them that's based on mutual respect and goal, and goal setting. And already you're setting a goal of, you know what, other people have done this, I'm not. I'm here for you. Go ahead. Um, I love how this conversation is great, but I think I'm still a little bit hung up on the speed part because um, for a lot of us who work in clinic settings, I think wait lists are the norm. Um, so how would you address <coughs> issue in terms of like still reaching out quickly, but what if you can't get them in the door right away? Yep. Or should you not reach out until you can get them in the door? Like what, what would your suggestions be? There are necessary evils out there, aren't there? Like things like wait lists and stuff like that. Um, and, I, and I don't, that's going to be an it depends answer and you know, we can go into some of what that might look like. Um, with the family work we do, we don't have a lot of, of wait lists, um, but when we do have it, um, we do make sure the families know up front what's going on. Um, so you know, right now, this place where we don't have enough availability, here are referrals for you if things are urgent and you need more of crisis care right now. But if you're willing to wait, here's what we're going to be able to do for you. So we still expect that reach out to be rapid. So they, they know you've got the referral and you care about them, but you're kind of stuck. And then you follow up. It's not a one-shot deal. 
because your timeline and their timeline are very different. They don't understand the notion of rotating caseloads and what that means. They don't know what your length of service is, what the availability for your, your agency or your clinic is. And so you want to reach out to them, give them a sense of expectation of things they can control. Not, not they can control, but at least that you can control. Um, even though it might not completely conform to, like, you don't want to give them a saying, oh, we'll, we'll be in touch with you in 12 weeks. If you can't, if you can't uh, meet that promise, 100% guarantee, you need to tell them. You know what, right now we have full caseloads. Typically what happens is, as families open up, um, we're able to start bringing in more. Right now most of our cases are relatively early, so it might be a couple of months. Or you know what, several of our cases are nearing the end. We'll be getting back in touch within a week or so, just to let you know how close it's looking. Um, and then call them back again. So you need to dedicate somebody's time to that reach out for the families that are on the waiting list. And I would reach out pretty consistently to them. If not weekly, I'd want to make sure you're doing it every other week. Yeah. yeah. Now again, that's an it depends answer though. But they're, they still are experiencing you, even though you're not working with them in therapy. And if you are respectful of that experience, and just reach out with very minimal stuff. Two minutes of your time goes a long way for hooking them in later. Okay. Um, and again, I appreciate that because I'm cramming a bunch of stuff into a, an implementation basket for the work that goes on a lot in the inner city agency context as opposed to just kind of a broader context for it. So you gotta think through in those early contexts of getting the right people in the room. Um, so you, you know, I'm so-and-so, <laughs> um, you know, thank you. I, I picked up the referral for, from, you know, from Mrs. Johnson over here at the Juvenile Justice Center. Um, you know, you, you talked a little bit about, what's your understanding of why the referral was made to me? Um, did she tell you about what it is we might be doing here together? Did she talk to you about who needs to be involved? Um, and based on all of those responses, you're gonna tailor your reaction. So if she says, yeah, she told me that I need to bring my son in, um, and you know, to, to be seen there once a week. Oh, so, so you have a, a sense that this is supposed to be kind of a once a week kind of outpatient thing and they told you to come to us. And so you can have, have a whole conversation about going to them or not. But one of the key things here is you wanna make sure you expand who is going to be participating. So they gave you the sense that this was gonna be about, about maybe your son coming in to talk to me. Did they talk to you at all about your involvement as part of this process? Um, because sometimes uh, you, know, you have a very different experience than the referral source does. And I want to make sure whatever we're doing kind of fits with, with what your goals are also. Is there anybody else in the home that's there pretty regularly that, that plays an important role in your son or daughter's life? Is there anybody that you're in conflict with in the home or outside of the home that you have daily contact with that things may get better or worse when you're around? How are you going to talk to your son about this? How are you gonna to talk to your husband about it? What barriers? How do you think they're gonna to respond to it? What are the barriers they're gonna have? You know, my God, my husband's really busy. Um, he works you know, 12, 14 hours. So this is probably better if it's just the two of us. Um, do you think maybe if I talk to him, we, we might be able to find a time that would work? Is that something to be okay with you? Or they may say something along the lines of, you know, he works long hours, but I think if I tell him this is really important that the three of us are together, you know, he and I and, my, and, and our son, he'll, he'll come along. Well, what will you say to him that will help, you know, in, improve those chances? And she gives you a good answer, you don't need to call him. But if he doesn't give you a good answer, you better be ready to start talking to him and develop an alliance. A lot of times, these hidden male figures never get asked to be involved in treatment by the provider. They get shut out of the process very early by a well-intended person who is protecting the structure. When you look at brief strategic family therapy, one of the things they will talk about is a contact person protecting the structure. When a contact person is protecting the structure in the family, you as a therapist need to adjust your behavior to move around that. We're not gonna change the structure yet. We're just gonna dodge it and go directly to the source rather than fight it. Accommodate that to them and their pattern rather than battle it. Move to the next person in the line. Get the permission of the contact person and move around them. Yeah. What if you don't get that permission? Because like a lot of times moms will be like, no, like he doesn't want to be involved. 
involved. Like, yeah. he's so not into this. Like, yeah. he doesn't even think everything's the right thing. Like, it's yeah. just going to be me. And, like, so yeah. Could you guys hear the response? Yeah. The question there? OK. Do you all hear it? Um, you sound like you're on an island. Um, when I hear you talk that way, it sounds like you are Atlas carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. Is it exhausting? Yeah. You already know where you're trying to fight me on, so yeah. 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 <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not going to tell her you're wrong. Um, but I'm going to go quickly to where I see I need to connect with her to, be, to have an influence on her. Um, but it's not going to get there by actually telling her where I want her to go. I'm going to pull her there using her own momentum. You never do the like, well, it's really important to no. have like, everybody. Then you've given your power away. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's a debate rather than her making the decision. So respond. It is tough, isn't it? Um, and I appreciate where you're at um, with your husband and, and all of that. And I wonder if part of that, and I, and I could be completely off base. You, you know him better than I do. If a part of his kind of not wanting to get involved is kind of that sense of things, he can't make it better either. Um, so you, do you guys share some of that hopelessness? Yeah. Do you think that might be something I could at least talk to him about? Maybe not to come to therapy necessarily, because maybe he doesn't have the time. But it would be okay to speak to him around that sense of hopelessness, so that even if he's not as involved, the messages we're sending match to where he's at. Okay, so yeah, just kind of dodge and move and move. Yeah. You do that on the phone. Yeah, yeah, you don't have him in front of you yet. Yeah, the the minute you got it, yeah. <laughs> It is easy to do it in person. That's why the engagement work is harder. Yeah. Um, but there it's, I'm not track, I, I'm tracking her to connect with her and respect where she's at, not challenge it. But I'm not giving up my goal in that part of the process. Mm -hmm. But it just takes two steps rather than just telling her, no, I'm the doctor, you're gonna do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Somebody had their hand up. So this is where also the school piece comes again, very, very important. In the setting I was at where I had nine full-time clinicians on the I mean, it's very unique. That doesn't exist anywhere, but go through the school because your strongest ally. Some <coughs> families have developed these strong relationships with the school, mm -hmm. trust already yeah. the school or some yeah. key people, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a counselor, yeah. whether it's somebody there. That yeah. then it, Again, the value is that this is very important. And always keeping in mind that the pathology is very, or the whatever yeah. you want to call it, I don't know if use the right terminology. You're fine. It's yeah. bigger, it's yeah. a family thing. And yeah. you want to engage all of those players because that's, you target this little thing, you leave out the, the dude that's living in the house that these, I mean, 70% mm -hmm. of my moms were had these men coming in and out of their lives because they were the kids, they're the parents, they're the guys paying the bills. So you have to involve the, you have to look at the whole dynamic. That's yeah. not going to change. And there's a resentment of the mom by the kid and you know, all of that. But the school knows that. And if you don't go to some of the people that can also each tremendously support what you want to achieve, mm -hmm. they have a lot of valuable information. Yep. Don't leave them out. They can help you. So, and and you, there's, a few no, there's a few really, really great points I want to highlight from that. Um, one of them is there was a contingency inside of what you said. This is a good relationship where they trust you guys already. For God's sakes, use that. And that's the whole point of kind of developing the relationship with referral sources. If you have a good relationship with referral sources and the family is positively connected there, your life is easy. It's like putting the puzzle together. When they have a contentious relationship with the referral source, it's trickier. Um, so if you have social welfare, child welfare involved, um, and the family has a history of really negative interactions and they're terrified, about consequences in the child welfare system, that's a different ball game. Um, juvenile justice is a little bit of the same thing. Some of the kids have great relationship with their POs. Some don't. How many of you guys have seen The Hunt for the Wilder People? Anybody? Yeah, just one. I love it. Strongly recommend you guys watch the show. But there's one point where the kid is like looking down onto a, a you know, down to where his dad is, 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 uh, is being, there's a, a group of a SWAT team coming to get his foster father and uh, they've got dogs coming in and the child wel welfare worker who is actually the antagonist, she's the bad guy in the movie, um, she comes out of a helicopter. So the kid sees the, the, the SWAT team, ninjas, then he sees the dogs, werewolves, and then she gets out of the helicopter and goes, child welfare. <laughs> If, if that's the relationship, you got a problem. <laughs> so that's why I say there's a contingency there. But use that relationship. Um, I say use that one not as your first step, though. You want to keep it relational. You want to keep it to them in that moment. 
if you have to go back to the probation worker and others, then you can do that. But what you're doing at that point is you're creating a connection between you and somebody else that can move you towards your goals. That's okay. If it was somebody who you have a, they have a contentious relationship with, you're going to push that to later in treatment once they have the skills to negotiate that relationship. So we'll layer it in later. We're not going to deal with it right up front. Was there another question back here? No? We're doing okay here on time. Okay. See where we're at in this whole process. Um, Uh, right. Very important in, in a lot of the work we, that we're talking about. Um, I was the master trainer uh, for Brief Strategic Family Therapy at the University of Miami for about 10 years. And now I'm the clinical director for Functional Family Therapy. And I've been doing FFT kind of work for, God, almost 30 years now. 1988 is when I started working with FFT. Um, I do frost my hair, but other than that, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's taken its toll on me over time. Um, I, I really, I, I don't even start any training ever with a technique or saying FFT is an integrated cognitive behavioral and systemic model. We actually start with this first slide. This is pretty much where we spend most of our morning is about what it takes to be respectful and non-judgmental and strength-based with families. And that's all we do. I take, I take three hours in the morning, introduce myself to the therapist, and then we go and have a lot of fun with trying to figure out how the hell you can demonstrate respect for people who are doing so much of, they're spending so much of their time and their energy behaving in ways that are just real toxic towards one another. So when we talk about being respectful, I'm not telling you to respect them or their behavior, but I can ask you to behave respectfully. And we want them to experience you behaving respectfully. Non-judgmental seems straightforward enough. Oh, but there are so many subtle ways we tell people that what they're doing is wrong. Just in how we ask the questions, we're sending the message that, you know what, Dad, that's not good enough. No wonder your kid is acting that way. And being strength-based, and I'm, I'm a little bit crude. Um, the more I get to know you, the more crude I become. <laughs> um, but you can be strength-based and be Pollyannish, or you can be strength-based and be real. And so I'm going to be looking for places to be strength-based and be real. And I'll give you my crude response later, maybe. Um, because so much of the work ends up being perfume. And it really, things are really not that rosy. And we're trying to make them that way. Being strength-based does not mean being Pollyannish. Oh, it's wonderful. You guys are all concerned about one another. No, that ain't it. Um, that's not strength-based. We are relational rather than individual. Every statement that our therapists make when they're doing family therapy, we want, we want it to be relational, not individual. So mom comes in and says, you know what? I'm sick of them. I want them out of my house. You could say, you sound really angry. And that would be psychotherapy 101 reflection and it gets you absolutely nowhere in family therapy. Doesn't hurt. Maybe it's a point in the relational capital bank for mom feeling heard and understood, but it also withdrew one point from the son. So it's an even, you're just an even trade across the board. So you gotta think through, what does it look like when you're reflecting somebody from a relational perspective or acknowledging somebody from a relational perspective? So we talk about acknowledgement rather than validation. Validation implies agreement. We spend a lot more time talking about what a an acknowledgement from a relational perspective looks like. What would an acknowledgement from a relational perspective look like to that statement? Pardon me? That's perfect. It's about, it's about a relationship. It doesn't spray perfume on it either. You lose no ground. And you're setting the stage already, you know what, this is about you guys. And she's not going to disagree with that one. It doesn't lower negativity and blame, but it actually moves you towards a relational focus, which is a great goal. You want to shake things up a little bit. 
most of the systems become rigidly defined and they get tighter and tighter. The tighter and more inflexible the system, the more of a problem it is. So you want to spread things out. And that spreads it out. Um, matching to individuals and families. I'm, I'm going to talk about this at two levels. One of them is just the generic level and the other one's about FFT. Um, BSFT does this also. But uh, matching to individuals in terms of language, your tone, um, uh, your use of space, um, and, uh, and whether you're talking in terms of thought words or feeling, uh, or feeling words. So you match to people based on whatever they're bringing to you. In family therapy, the trickier part is that it's not just about individuals, it's also about matching to the system level. And so in BSFT and FFT, early in treatment, there's a real intense focus on not rocking the boat. Meet them where they're at and use their structure to achieve your early goals of motivation. So if dad's in charge and brings in a piece of paper and says, I want you to read this, what my son wrote about me, or look, mom's in charge and brings in a, a thing, go, here's the suicide note the, note the teacher gave us. I want you to take a look at this. This is what we're, this is what our struggle is. We're terrified what's going to happen next. How do you handle that without losing capital with the kid? These are real examples of things that therapists have to struggle with. Acknowledgement. Give the note. A kid may even come in with a note and say, here's the note I wrote. Parents in charge. Maybe even going, can I have your permission to give that to your parent? And we'll talk about that maybe next session. But right now, just give it to them and let them hold it for a little bit. Things will be okay. If parents in charge, that matches the system perfectly. In, F, in FFT, we never fight that relational battle. We don't care if parents are one up or one down. There are, many, there are many circumstances of kids that have a ton of power in their home, and they do great things. There are many examples of, of parents that are highly connected and involved with their kids. Some people would say it's in, over-involved and enmeshed, and their kids are amazing. We are constantly matching to the families to give them adaptive ways of being connected that work rather than maladaptive ways. If their only way to get the parent to, to be involved is to go out and use substances or cut on themselves so the parent gets terrified and just smothers them, are there ways they can get that level of contact for their, from their parent without having to engage in that behavior? The function, the structure is not pathological. The behaviors are. And we replace them. So when you heard the resilience presentation earlier, that's where a lot of this, that's, a lot of it ends up looking just like that. We actually are matching constantly to the fact that in the worst circumstances you could possibly imagine, there are still kids who thrive. That's so hopeful for me. No matter where I'm at, in this neighborhood, this kid is exposed to doom, 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 doom. How come the kid next door is thriving? What, are that, what does that family look like? And we start matching to the sample and help them out using their resources, their values, and their skills, not ours. This is about them. So there's no mental health ideal in FFT. That goes out the window. This is about them all the time. It's a different way of thinking about it. So let's talk about strength-based relational and we'll take a break. Um, all right, so being strength-based and relational. Um, do you guys remember some of the examples I gave earlier? Okay, we'll, uh, I'm going to be really mean for a second. How, with students again, could you raise your hands? It's not fair. How about young students, could you please raise your hand? I'm going to use one of them right here. <laughs> do you have kids? That was one of the questions, remember? Yeah. Do you have kids? What's the strength in that statement? You don't have kids, so you don't want to understand what happened to them. They say that to you. Mm -hmm. But what's, so what's the strength in it? They have some special 
knowledge of being a parent and doing something that yeah. other people don't have. That's nice. Yeah. Others? A special connection there. I want to be connected to somebody. I want somebody to be able to understand me. Doesn't matter whether you say yes or not. That was still a strength there. No. Others? Go Hallmark on their ass. Come on. Come up with something. Yeah. yeah. So for God's sakes, if you don't, what do you do though then? Make up children? <laughs> yeah, I do. They're lovely. Yeah. <laughs> um, have have you yeah have you been have you ever been in substance abuse treatment? Have you ever been depressed? Um, are you a left-handed Lithuanian immigrant? Um, I mean, where does it stop? You know, in terms of the comparison to to be able to know, do you understand me on my terms? Don't tell me you're going to say the left-handed Lithuanian immigrant stuff came up in therapy. <laughs> I just remember one of the things that I have in, uh, in, in Jackson, he, she said to me, did you use uh, marijuana? So, um, yeah, just right before the session to put up with you guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh -huh. yours. Yeah. So I That's an interesting okay, so let, let so let's take a left turn and, and go down that one because it's the same thing. It's the same principle there. Um, the hallmark one or one of the hallmark ones on the uh, um, do you have children? is, you know, I'm going to answer that because it's easy if to duck it, that's fine. You know, no, I don't have children. But it does make me wonder kind of like why you ask that part of it. You know, a piece of that is, can you understand what we're going through? And I get that. How long have you been the one who's been in the protective role for your family? Because you asked the question. And so now you've made it relational and you've taken it to the next level. Um, yours is more complicated. Have you used marijuana? Um, that's, that's trickier. So let's play with that for a second. Because this, this is all what family therapy is about. So you tell me a manual is a manual and that's all and it, it's rigid and, and there's no creativity? There's so many things that go on on the ground. And on the ground, in the moment, is where we make a difference. Not in some manual, not in some note we're writing. It's what the family experiences. Because families do not benefit from interventions they don't receive. So we got to give it to them. So did you use marijuana when you were a kid? <laughs> Damn, so you, have, you struggled to answer that question. OK, good. So no, you know, I didn't, I didn't use. Was a part of that question to try to kind of see me as somebody might help to make sure mom understands where you're coming from? Because you guys don't agree on this. OK. Because that's different um, than some of the kids that come in here. Some of the kids come in here and they're like, you know what? Well, fuck you, you're just another authority figure. Mm -hmm. You actually saw me as being somebody who might be able to help you and I appreciate that part of it. Mom, you don't like it because he was trying to use me against you. But I, you know, that's okay. But that's part of what you guys are doing and that's where you're stuck. That's where everyone's got it right in this family is that this is the problem here. So that's where it's not Pollyannish. You go in and you go in deep and you make it relevant. Let's say you have used, that you weren't such a good kid, and you actually did experiment with marijuana in your kid. What do you say to the kid? Give it a shot. Somebody. I mean, it's a, it's, 
you know, 80% of our kids are using marijuana. So like, like that's like a, it's almost not even, it's like a mute point, you know, and they're, and they're using it with their parents sometimes. Yeah. You know, and it's just yeah. like, that's yeah. not even an issue. I mean, yeah. it's no longer like that taboo that was maybe even 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, but um, I think, I don't even know, I don't, I don't want to <coughs> go off your, your, your train of what you're trying to do, but I think the transparency, the honesty, parents appreciate that. They want to relieve that shame they don't want to be shamed. They don't. Mm -hmm. They think every. They're the only ones in this position. They're the only ones that have failed because it's really about. Yeah. They they failed, but we all feel the same way about ourselves. We just have to be very honest. That listen, we. Some families will feel that way. Absolutely. We have failed yeah. about anything. This yeah. is not an issue. Yeah. And you and you and you know you just you, just, you don't want to yeah. minimize. You want to acknowledge that yeah. we're here to help. Yeah. We're not here to. Yeah. Put you out there and. Yeah, and, but but how you do that is is the is the tricky part. Absolutely. Because you, because you can just convince me, you know what, I'm just here to help you guys. I'll be right there. I'm just here to help you. <laughs> Don't ask me any personal questions. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm just here to help, for God's sakes, <laughs> right? Um, you know, that's a complicated question, you ask me. Because I think a part of you is just going, you know what, if it was so bad and you did it, who are you to tell me to stop it? And that part I appreciate. Because you're in a position where everyone else is telling you how to live your life. And you know what? My role here is not to tell you how to live your life at all. So if you want to tell me how to live mine, that's a different story because we're going to be operating from a different place. But I'm okay with you asking that question because it shows you're going to go out there and get right in my face if you need to. So that says I can trust you. I can trust you're going to come to me with it. Mom, I know that trust might be experienced by you very differently because that's where you two butt heads and that's where you fight. Because you don't see it as I trust you, mom. You see that as, you know what, I'm fighting you tooth and nail. And really that's what's going on. So you acknowledge still, but you, you don't answer that question necessarily. I'm never gonna tell a kid something that I did when I was a kid, although I was perfect. I didn't do anything. <laughs> do not talk to my mother. Yeah. Yeah. Close that to my yeah. Client, especially in my first encounter with them. Yeah. Yeah. So, I I could not agree I could not agree with you more. Yeah. 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 I could not agree with you more. The professional boundary one is is a great conversation to have. I'm not going to go there, but it's a great conversation to have. We need to always maintain true, main, you know, stay true to who we are as professionals. I'm not against self disclosure when you disclose something that is in their interest and it's strategic. A lot of times it just comes out as a little bit of noise and it's more of the therapist issue than it is the fam you know, being done for the family. And then supervision takes on a different quality as we were talking about earlier, Nora. It becomes less about the model and more about whatever the therapist is struggling with because buttons are getting pushed. Yeah. You're doing good. Like, you know, you're really, um, you really want to make sure that you get the best um, in therapy. Can I just go in there? And say mm -hmm. you absolutely. That? Yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't, it, that meets them where they're at. Yeah, I, I hear you. You want to get the best out of it. Mm -hmm. And they may say, but you look young. And they might bring it back up again mm -hmm. because you didn't answer the question. <laughs> and so at some point you may need to just answer the question. Sometimes it's easier to just deal with it. Um, you know, you're going to be different than the people you work with, um, guaranteed. If you're doing family therapy, about 50% of the people you work with, no matter what, are going to be different than you in one key way. Yeah. Um, and 99% are going to be different than others. <laughs> but just gender and what we bring in gender-wise immediately creates different sets of contingency for men and women when you walk in the room. Historically, um, I don't know if it's better or worse now, but historically, uh, female therapists encounter much more volatile clinical context than male therapists do. Women um, tend to be much more supportive towards female therapist supportive statements than they are towards male therapist supportive statements. And both male and female clients tend to respond much more defensively um, to a female therapist structuring statement. Um, so things that don't conform to gender role stereotypes 
families struggle with, with female ther therapists more than male therapists. Female therapists get just as good of outcomes as male therapists, but just how the process unfolds looks a little bit different. So just being aware of that stuff walking in and how you react to people is critical. I'm always of mind, be real, be honest, stay professional, um, and, and operate within your comfort zone. And if your comfort zone is very narrow, then you're only going to have a narrow group you're going to be effective with. So think of ways to expand your repertoire. All right. You, did you have a comment earlier? I know your arm was up at some point. Okay. Like it was, you weren't trying to ask me a question that was one of these? No? Okay. All right. Um, we're going to take a break in, uh, let's say, five minutes. Um, eight minutes. Eight minutes. I'm going to give you guys one statement. And I want you in your tables to come up with one strength-based relational response. Okay? Um, how about this one? Um, ah, I'm not going to be that mean. Um, we'll pick the other one. You know what? She uh, just lacks, I don't know, that, what, it, what out the rest of us have, she just lacks that human piece. It's missing. She's just broken. Everything would be better if she wasn't around. Mom to kid. Come up with one strength base, just one, guys. And the you, minute you're done, you get the hell out of here, go take a break, come back here at 3.30, and we'll be back at it. But come up with one of them, we'll, and we'll talk about them when you come back. Okay, what's the strength-based part of frustration? Because there is strength-based. What is it? Okay, there's caring inside of there. Excellent. You got it. You've got a theme to start playing with. Um, and that's really where we start. You're looking for traction, is all with people, and so that gets you there. So starting with the frustration as your springboard into caring, something beyond that, that's great. Good. And I like the fact of getting worried about, do I use the term you, or, yeah, that, it's, it's, it's tricky. Um, I listened, to, when I was hearing just some of the conversations around the room, I heard your daughter, you know, mom, you know, so using the role, role statements rather than just saying you is another way of kind of getting around that too. All right, this way. <laughs> I told them, sir, that, I was, that we are, we're an agency that we refer out, so um, we're a referral source, so the professional shit. Oh, okay. You know what, I mistakenly just heard the voice of authority getting ready to tell me this, but you're kicking it off to them. <laughs> Let's hear it. Um, you miss your child, you want your daughter back, and it's important for you to see your child as whole. You went all the way Hallmark, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. All right. Good. <laughs> Go ahead. Right here. Oh, so God knows what you came up with then. <laughs> I'm taking it for the team. Okay. So we wrote, I understand you feel loss of hope, but also I hear concern. It's understandable, and how can we find a solution to rebuild the relationship? Okay, very good. Okay, caring again comes out. Okay. It's very easy to go to the solution part, um, and what I will just encourage all of you guys when you're thinking about motivating people, don't need to go there. Okay? You can send the hopeful message, though. I hear you want something different, and I appreciate you're willing to come to me to that because that's something side by side I'll be there with you on. That gets the hope side there, but the solution piece starts getting you into the working, and they're not ready to work yet. The front part, outstanding. Really, really good. For folks who haven't gotten any training, good guys at least in FFT, this whole strength-based relational crap. <laughs> middle. <laughs> middle table. We're kind of similar to you, sir, back here. So. I don't think so. I think you're very unique snowflakes. <laughs> 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 I would not sell you short. I know those guys at the back table, and you really don't want to be affiliating with them. <laughs> not that way. <laughs> um, don't know. <laughs> 
my, I think the part we sort of had a couple things kick around. Like part of it is that um, yeah, there seems to be a lot of a lot of a lot of stress in the family that's hurting the relationship, and that what I hear is that you really want to want to connect with your child. Mm -hmm. So blame something else, which is great. So expand it out where there's not really a target, there's just stress here, it's tough, and the contact with your kid. Good, similar to the one over here too, about getting kind of back in touch with your child. Uh, here? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we had to write it down. We put a lot of there. Okay. <laughs> it better be good. I know. Yeah, I yeah. Right. yeah, no pressure yeah. now. Okay. Ooh, ooh, you went out on a limb, yes. okay? For God's sakes, do something is a strategy that I will train people in, and that is something. You went on a limb with a kid. That's good, okay? All right? Oh, you wrote it down too, okay. <laughs> Did you guys write it down? I didn't think so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I mean, you know. the disconnect takes a toll on your relationship. It sounds like both of you have a desire for a better situation. Good. <laughs> oh, so we Excellent. What I like is that you guys are very much into trying to connect and, and really show your professionalism. Thank you very much. Is that better? Is that a better acknowledgement? <laughs> it was outstanding. That's a great, that, that would be one we could put in a textbook. All right, go ahead. Okay, fantastic. These are all great. Yeah, it was better than your response, sorry. Yeah. And they didn't even write it down. <laughs> um, your reaction most likely is, to, is gonna be, what the hell are you talking about? Our interventions aren't delivered in a single statement. A lot of it's just body blow after body blow after body blow to soften them up until they feel like you know, they, they really can buy something you're selling. Because when you guys jumped, to a couple of different places. You did a lot of reattribution as part of this process. And when you start moving to reattribution, if you haven't established your relational capital first, that they feel heard and understood, they're gonna have a hard time buying it, what it is you're selling. What you sold was very much strength-based and relational, right on target. So mom, she's lacking what is that human thing. You know, she just doesn't have any compassion. There's nothing there. She's like a monster. Um, things would be better without her. So the two of you guys really want something different. That's nice. It's strength-based and relational. And that might throw mom off of her game. So if you think of a wagon traveling over a, a dirt road over and over and over again, those, those ruts in the, in the road get deeper and deeper and deeper. Part of therapy is getting people out of those ruts. Part of our use of language does that at a cognitive level, and we use structure, and I'll talk about this in motivation, um, to do that at an interactional level also. Powerful techniques in most of the evidence-based work involve the art of being rude. Being able to interrupt and divert people when they're in the middle of all that negativity in a way that's respectful is really part of what all of this is about. And so you guys did a great job with the strength-based and relational thing. And you're hearing comments about rejection. You're hearing comments about hate and about, I don't want to have my kid in my life anymore. And it requires more of our compassion, more of our confidence, and more of our competent interventions. And it requires you to be fearless. Because this gets intense, really intense in the room with families. And so you've got to be able to stick right in there and go with them without being one up, without setting ground rules, without telling them, no, you can't talk that way to your son or your daughter, but using the power of your words to influence their behavior. So you've done a great job as this first kind of pass through it.
Uh, excellent. This was my little quote to get you set for the uh, little exercise, but we never got to that because I talked too damn much. Um, let's talk about motivation for a little bit. So from an FFT perspective, there are different ways of going about this, um, but in FFT, there are a few things we're looking to do um, when we come into the room and work with the family early in treatment. You got them into a session, you're starting to do your work. One of the things we want to do is manage negativity and blame. And we think about them as negativity and blame. Um, some families just fight, and it's kind of their natural state, um, but it doesn't have a lot of the, the real um, demeaning, blame-based statements. And others have very low levels of negativity, but the blame is toxic. The things they say to each other are so hateful and spiteful. Even though it's not done at a high level of, of conflict and negativity, it just comes out as so demeaning. Low frequency, but real toxic. We're going to try to address both of those and smother them early on. Our goal is not to create change in cognition or perception. Our goal is to create a moment in time where family members are willing to try something different. And it can be a real fleeting moment, but at least they experience each other just a little bit differently. So there's that negativity and blame piece. We want to create a family focus. This is not just about an individual. This is about all of you guys together. <clears throat> we want to instill hope that engaging in this process is worth it and can end up with a positive outcome. And we want to try to build balanced alliances. Balanced alliances are achieved through family members feeling heard and understood, feeling they're being respected, and they're being viewed with dignity or nobility. This is a big part of FFT and also BSFT. This idea of finding nobility in people's behavior. Moms, you know, you sound frustrated. So mom, I'm furious. A relabel of furious is frustrated. Frustrated, a relabel of that is annoyed. I'm annoyed. You're a little upset. All of those soften things and move you towards a new way of, of dealing with the negativity. We refer to those as relabels. I'll talk about those more in a second. Um, you can also change the valence, shift the meaning. Um, you know, a big part of this, mom, is I see you working hard to protect yourself from what's going on with your daughter. And so this isn't as much about your anger as it is about your own ability to kind of survive and be protective of your own interests. It's a reframe of her behavior. I see a huge part of this, mom, is you're afraid of letting her down. It's almost easier to let her go than to fail again with her. I understand that a lot of this is driven by your desire to want what's best for her and actually protect her. You trust us to deal with her more than yourself. That's got to be a terrifying place to be. But you've done what you needed to do to get her here and protect her that way. Now you've given her nobility in her behavior. It's not just about protecting herself. There's nobility. There's dignity in her actions. And what she said was, my child is a monster. But you've turned it into something that has dignity in it. People don't fight you when you go there. So we're looking for places to make it to that place where it's dignity rather than just simply the negativity. Fair enough? Makes sense? You're going to see this being done in a session in a minute. Um, there's two classes of techniques in FFT. One of them is change focus. The other is change meaning. And I just kind of keep it really simple. Change focus is you basically just kind of jump into the structure of the communication to alter it. So if somebody is being very negative, you interrupt it. If somebody is being negative towards someone else and you expect that person to respond, you jump in and divert the flow of communication so they can't respond to it. There's just things structurally you can do to take over the, to take over the, uh, the room without actually um, having to challenge anybody. Um, selectively attending to positive, that was part of what you guys were doing in coming up with the strength-based statements. There was strength in what mom was saying. Hard to see, but it was there. This mom actually was furious in the session where she said that because her daughter refused to get out of the room, get out of the car, to go meet mom's first grandkid. Older brother's um, partner had just had a baby. Mom gets her in the car, drives her all the way to go and, and, and meet her granddaughter. And her own daughter won't get out of the car to do it. The reason why, daughter had not had any contact with her brother for over a year because he'd beat her pretty severely. Um, when he found drug paraphernalia um, in her room, um, in her uh, drawer, 
after the school had called to say that she'd beat another student with a baseball bat. And he beat her pretty severely. So this, all of a sudden, here's mom trying to whisk this daughter away to go see grandchild, and kid doesn't get out. Therapist response to mom was, mom says this pretty early in the process, you can't say that to your daughter. That was her response. But the positive thing inside of all of that was mom saw this as a chance to bring her family back together again. And a lot of you guys were hitting on that connection, which is where you wanted to go. And it didn't take, you didn't have to do anything else on that. That was the acknowledgement of her. This is a tough situation. When I went in the room, I said to mom, you're in a tough situation. She goes, you're damn right I am. Smart woman. And the daughter looked at me like, what the hell are you talking about? And I go, you don't know what I mean, do you, to the daughter? She goes, no. And I said, hang in with me for a second because I want to talk to your mom. Are you okay with that? And she said, yeah. And I go, the tough situation was you saw, you saw this as a chance to be a mom to both of your kids, not just your daughter. This was your chance to bring your family back together again. And she's like, yes, that was it. So with just an acknowledgement, you're already moving towards your goals. Family, you know, family relational, negativity and blame, hope and balanced alliances. That guides every single thing I will say in a first, second, or third session with the family. Even when I don't know what to say, that's what's going to guide it. When I don't know what to say, I go to what I call pointing process because people cannot not interact. So no matter what they're doing, they're interacting. So whatever they're doing in the session in front of me, I can just comment on it and it moves me towards my relational goal. That uh, families can't not interact is a Watzlawick quote from like kind of the foundational family therapy fathers. Um, so if I see them, you know, they walk right in the room and they're not talking, you know, so I just see you two are pretty tuned into each other. You both know that if you're going to say anything, you're going to go off, so you stay quiet. Um, or, you know what, you guys are really quiet right now. That's also pointing process. It's making it relational. It moves you towards your relational goal. It doesn't get you very far there, but at least it's consistent. That's called pointing process. Sequencing is doing the same thing, but you're doing it about what happens outside of therapy. So when you come home after curfew, son, Mom's the one who's been pacing, waiting up for you. You're getting angrier and angrier. Dad, you're in, you're in the other room sleeping. They start fighting. Does that happen pretty immediately? It sounds like you ask some circular questions, get some of that because you're getting their relationship with one another. Dad, you hear him fighting, you come out. Pretty soon you're fighting with him and mom, you've kind of drifted off in the back. That's sequencing. That's a relational intervention in FFT. You have a sense of that whole pattern that they're engaging in. It made it relational and connected them doesn't change it, it's helping on that relational goal during that motivation phase. <coughs> and I told you, for God's sakes, do something. Intervention is there, and, and it's something I will encourage therapists. Don't just sit on your hands. Families are not going to change on their own. You've got to get in the mix. Um, yeah, and you do need to listen. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, it all starts with that. Um, on the relabels and theme hints, um, if you think, I, I have, I have an, a, an emotional color wheel in here too, but if you just take um, an intense comment and soften it, but you don't change the emotional valence, we refer to that as a relabel. So the one I just gave you, I'm so furious, you were angry. I'm so angry, you were upset. You just soften it. We refer to those as relabels. And they're a way of moving you towards your goal of reducing negativity. A theme hint is very similar in terms of its short burst. It's a, it's a short statement where you're not really sure what the larger story is, but you hint at something. It seems like protection is a big issue for this family. Or I get the sense that there's a lot of loss here. So you throw something out that is different. It's, it hints at a larger theme of what might be explaining the behavior, but it doesn't really get developed at all. Does this make sense, guys? I'm being really quick on it. Yeah. Can you sort of explain, I guess, the relabeling and because as like, if someone says like they're like extremely frustrated, you go, you're angry, and then I can see it going, you're totally missing my point, and you know, I was frustrated, you know, like you're not matching them on their level. <laughs> and as a therapist or a psychologist, you know, you're sort of supposed to match you know, I was taught to match where, where they're at. Mm -hmm. 
understand you're saying to come down and sort of bring them down to, I guess. This is much, yeah, this, this is much more subtle than that. Um, if you acknowledge at their level, you get more at their level. And, and it's okay if you're putting relational capital in the bank to meet them at their level, but at some point we have to transform this to where they're willing to try something new. And so you want to, you want to start with the acknowledgement process, but you want to be introducing these new pieces so you soften things up over time. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck with them. Simply that reflecting where they're at at their level just gets you more intensity. In fact, typically it actually increases it rather than decreases it. In my, in my dissertation, um, one of the things I did is I broke down what happened moment to moment inside of family therapy sessions. And negativity, the probability of negativity actually increases exponentially every single time a new negative statement comes out in a sequence. And so at some point you had to get in there and throw something new into the mix. Reflections were as toxic for generating negativity as a family negative comment was. And so, it, you know, so you, it's okay for the alliance part of it, but it's not okay for the negativity and blame piece of it. So I'm okay with acknowledgments at that level, but sooner or later it's got to go to that next place. Otherwise, they're going to stay there. We, create a, we, we want to create a new narrative yeah, together with them, and we're pretty active about it. Um, it's a pretty manipulative model that way. We don't wait for the narrative to emerge as some kind of process with them that's going to unfold because it just doesn't. It becomes more toxic. So we go in with benevolent intentions and, uh, and after that we're pretty manipulative. Yeah, it's our language where we get there. Uh, I think I mentioned, uh, to, uh, he might have left, the uh, read Milton Erickson uh, work if you can about the, the notions of creating yes sets and the art of language inside of therapy. He was a precursor for Jay Haley's uh, str strategic work. Real beautiful writer too. Really cool stuff. And a lot of this is grounded in, in kind of Haley, uh, Milton Erickson and Haley stuff. Um, and I'm talking really fast because I want you guys to see video. You've been so diligent listening to the rest of this, but I want you to have a sense of what it is you're looking at. Um, with reframes, we're actually now shifting the valence. So it's no longer just simply softening it. It's actually coming up with a new explanation. So it's a reattribution. Somebody was doing this not because they were a rotten person, but for a different reason that was actually benign or even positive. When somebody are do is doing something that's benign or even positive in a selfless way or for somebody else, that adds dignity to it. Right? So with this girl, her not getting out of the car was a chance to make mom feel pain. It's sad, but it's true. And the reason she wanted mom to feel pain was because you missed her mom. And she felt that her mom really didn't connect with her and her pain. And she's desperate for her mother. This little girl is desperate for her mom. If her mom was able to feel as much pain as she was feeling, it was proof to her that her mom still loved her. So it might have looked really like a bad thing you were doing to her, but it was just your way of saying, Mom, I need you in my life. I just don't know how to ask for it in a way that's positive. So it's, it changes the narrative. And we're not waiting around for it. We actually create it and throw things out as hypotheses. We're not looking for truth. This is not interpretation. We're looking for plausible realities that will move you towards your goal. If it works for the family, fantastic. If it doesn't, like the shampoo bottle, rinse and repeat. Take a step back and try to come at it a different way. Okay. All right, we're going to stop there. Um, there's yeah, great stuff around uh, emotion, cognition, all the rest. But I want you to watch the, I want you to watch a session, and we're probably going to take the rest of the time, talk, at least 45 minutes, talking about it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop the session very often. So we'll go 45 minutes with the session and then we'll take 15 minutes to process it and we'll be done. You guys can hang in for that, for this last little run? Yeah. All right. This is a, a session conducted by Jim Alexander at the University of Utah back in the early 90s. Um, the identified patient in the session is actually a pretty young kid. 
Um, and that's not good. This is rolling really, really fast. Up, uh, oh, we got it. Thank God. Is that loud enough for you guys to hear? Mm -hmm. Okay. That was mom. Um, Luciano is a 15 year old boy, um, kind of run of the mill, little behavior problem kid, but not really out, that out of control. Uh, a little bit of oppositionality. He's been in contact with the system several times. The latest one was for shoplifting. So they refer to shoplifting school. It's not to go learn how to be better shoplifters. It's actually, he's being told to go to some program for remediation for his shoplifting. So it's pretty basic stuff. Huge problem in this session. You're going to see it. You're going to comment on it. Jim never engages the sister the entire freaking time. Um, mom basically is the problem in this session. Um, and Jim is not the therapist. He comes in because they're done. They're not going to come back for another session. This is a practicum. This is this therapist's first time ever working with a family, so be nice to her. Um, and uh, uh, Jim comes into the session with one goal, period, to get mom and kid to come in for the next session. Daughter's fully engaged throughout all of it. And I'll just tell you, I wasn't even worried about her, so I didn't talk to her. He wasn't thinking, how do I make this a great training video? He was thinking, how do I get mom back in the room for the next session? Um, mom is in the helping professions. You'll hear her talk about that. But I'm going to let it run and just haul her stuff out at you guys so you get a chance to see what this looks like. Maybe I'll do that. Yeah. You want to turn off the lights? You want popcorn, too? <laughs> Could you try to turn off the lights back there, guys, Amy or Natalie? Thanks. Does it go full what? Does it go full screen? Um, God, you know, you guys are so pushy and demanding. Takes advantage, says good lines. So I like just tell him I don't want to be a parent anymore. I'm tired and I'm burned out. So you're trying to do what I did here? Yeah, I'm burned out. I'm just totally. He burns me out. He just, you know, he's so exhausting. And maybe it might be like, well, your pain is not working for me. It's just another little catch all. It's, not, it's just another little, oh, mom, I feel bad when you scream. You know? Uh, you know, and I can tell him I feel bad when, when I don't have any control, but to scream, to suppress all the crap you're putting me through. What do you see happening? Mm -hmm. About the same thing, probably just what all I'm mm -hmm. So you two are going to just set up. Relabel. Mm -hmm. It is the gospel. <laughs> you use it. He uses everything. Puts himself in a one down position. Anita. Just Anita. 
okay, that's what I had. But somebody said you had it like to use a different pronunciation. I go, well, that's what I thought it was. But I thought you had. I don't pronounce it the way uh, the name is. Puts, puts himself out there, one down, and acknowledges the differences between them without having to put her out on the table. This is about you, Mom, and how you even say your name. He knows how to say your name. Yeah. Introduces pain into the mix, but still acknowledges the anger. Not being afraid to go there. Talk a good game. Acknowledge, put some money in the bank with kids. Bless you. Okay, so that just requires a lot of listening. A lot of that's just acknowledgement. This is what I'm hearing from you. This is what I'm getting. And he butters the kid up a little bit because there was all the words and literature kind of thing. For those of you who are on that clinical track, you already know when you're hearing it. He's, he's talking about an antisocial personality sociopath here. And mom gave a whole load of them that were like, I'm living with a sociopath. She's in the field. She's using language the way she thinks it needs to be used. He's not missing her. The kid's hearing it all. So he's starting this process already with a lot of acknowledgement of mom, but tracking where the kid's at and buttering him up just a little bit because he wants to track where he's at. He also created a little bit of, uh, of uh, dissonance for her. FFT, we don't think about it as dissonance. We just present alternatives in terms of reframes or selectively highlighting the positive. 
So he acknowledges the one piece, but says there's also this other one over here where it's the nurturance ones. Help me understand that. How many of you guys have, have been trained or heard about motivational interviewing? Yeah, so motivational interviewing, that's a classic MI technique in terms of creating dis dissonance. Because those are, those are both things she said. Now she has to kind of weigh through what that means. And it's a very non-directive way of helping people kind of move through a process and get motivated for change. We just think about it in terms of a relational reframing process. Ironically, maybe not ironically, the first book on, on motivational interviewing and the first book on FFT were published in the same year, about maybe 500 miles apart, one in Albuquerque and one in Utah. I think things were just kind of ripe for this different way of thinking at that point. <clears throat> so I'm going to run it for a while again. Just listen to mom's response and how he deals with the son on it. And we talk a lot. Sorry, I'm no different than Jim. FFT therapists talk a lot. Strength-based, relational. It's also a relabel. Interruption. That's the other half of the question that I want to remember. So there's two parts of where you were in this quote coming mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. I hear you being called something, you know, this macho stuff, manipulative, you know, all these words. words. And worse. Yeah, I'll call them the F word. Everyone, I mean, I hear you all the way word. The one and only. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's going to say it first? I mean, I don't know what the F word can mean, like... Like, I'll say, like, who in the fuck do you think you are? Oh, well, that's not calling you that. That's just that's showing not. feeling. Okay, I don't rush. You know, so I'm saying it directly. Okay. So I'm usually like, okay. Okay, I'm being a little bit... See how quickly he just went in and relabeled it? Didn't take a split second to just come up with a different label. Maybe it isn't nice. We don't let people off the hook. And you've been called some of those things. I've heard some of them in here. Okay. I I look at you and I hear you saying, but I want to love you, and I'm trying to communication train and all. And you know, I mean, I try I try to do this, mom. I try to do it at home, right? Didn't you say that? And I even heard your mom say. Yeah, but you know, something like, yeah, you tried it, but it's just, it's tried, it's not the real issue, and all that kind of stuff. So she didn't even disagree, you tried it, but she said it's just, even that's a manipulation. Okay. How come you don't act devastating? Because I just don't have temper. Okay. When this happens, when you heard what you heard then, is that what, is that what gets elicited in you as temper? Yeah. Okay, so you get this, and, and instead of you kind of hold it in, and then I'm, are you, why are you looking at her? I'm mad at her. Hmm? I'm mad at her. Okay, you're mad right now. All right. I have to ask you not to video them, okay? Just I have them even back there, not video them, well, too, so please, because these guys, yeah, I know you're fine, you're fine. Yeah, just to be safe for them, yeah. Just, just because I... She gets so direct, you know? Really, she 
Give an example about direct, what you mean by direct, and I want to tell Like F U, F U, so like, okay. And then I won't say anything back, I'll say, well, just end it, okay? Sure. Notice he's not asked them to do anything different with each other. See how he doesn't just simply go to the kid and give more of an acknowledgement or anything? What do you think about that mom? He takes it to a different place. Acknowledges it, but doesn't let them respond. Just pulls it back. Reframe. Very simple. Reframe. Sorry about bad editing. He asked her, how long have you felt this desperate? Since about the sixth grade. He turns it from anger to pain, asks her about how long she's felt this desperate, and she's already starting to change the language she's using to describe it. Doesn't stick around for very long. They go back to their dance pretty quickly because it's pretty locked in, but you see she has a lot of range, and you're on to a good, you know, you're on to a good attack with her around this pain and desperation. Pain and desperation is workable. The level of anger that I don't want to be a parent anymore, that's really hard to work with. People don't change from that place. We've gone to, uh, I've initiated a challenge before, it just didn't work out. But at that time, you knew what Lou also. Well, yeah, family you counseling. Oh, Lou's oh, your oldest. No, you know, we stand up. That's manipulating again. You know, it's too many things in your own way. Okay, sorry. And I apologize, I kind of blo blocked that sequence just a little bit. Um, she said that she got overwhelmed and hopeless when he was in the sixth grade. She sent him to a different school called St. Catherine's. And all he does is say, well, you were also dealing with stuff with my older brother, too, at that time. No, 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 that's manipulation. She's right on him on that. Focus on the issue, it just brings all this 
you know, I probably sometimes praise me over the issue real good that um, interruption. Disagree. I don't want to argue with that because if things are as I am beginning to think, I understand they are. That's a pretty natural tendency. He says, I can't, I can't get you to change. I can't convince you. I can't, you know, whether it's the intimidation or whatever. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to come up with extra evidence. So it's like, well, if it's just me, then why did you have trouble with rule also? If so and so it must not be me, it must be you, that kind of stuff. And theoretically, at least, what that would do is be his attempt to say, I feel powerless. I'm going to try to bring as much evidence as I can. And all it does is push you farther. Reframe. The wall and just, you know. I felt pretty powerless and pretty, um, uh, like I needed help since, since I, he uh, finished his elementary years. And I tried look at seeking help again, the least restrictive, the most natural um, type of way, and uh, explain to him what it is that I wanted, why I wanted to do things. When when went to St. Catherine's. No, uh, you you may do it sound like all this for your kid to have a read and basketball. And I went like a minute just thinking like I was going for basketball and all that stuff. He never told me why I was leaving because I didn't know. I wasn't doing things out back then. So I just left. I was I, I wanted to try it out. So I left. And, and, and yeah, I didn't want to like that. I was being disappointed. Until now, she did. She did. Because I told all my friends, oh, yeah, I'm going to put a room and all that. Now let, me, let me ask you. We could then say that your mom is being, you know, being sneaky, not telling you the truth, stuff like that. Another way of looking at it, I got a funny feeling neither of you are in a mood to buy any kind of what we call a reframe. It's like, don't even begin to tell me this person deserves to live on a certain level. But I'm going to say anyway, I'm going to ignore that. It is that part of it, she may have been protecting her, herself. They're just manipulating you. I'm going to tell you it's for money, but I'm smart, and I think that'll get you without a fight. But I'm only really doing it because you're making me crazy or something. It could also be at least some part of protecting you. It's like, I already feel overwhelmed by you. I don't, I'm scared. I don't have a lot of confidence in how I can deal with teenagers, and I'm taking some liberties. And can stop at any time. But I don't have a long track record where, like, all of a sudden you're the one who's the big exception. I don't have a lot of confidence. But I'm not going to sit around and tell you that you terrify me, that you overwhelm me, that maybe you intimidate me, and all that kind of stuff. Instead, I'm going to try to get it fixed the best way I can and the way it won't hurt you. I send you to a good place, and I tell you if it's for a good reason. Yeah. What? Are you following what I'm saying? Well, what I'm wondering is if we're, if, if we're... So he got what he needed out of it. Remember, a lot of the negativity is being driven by mom. That got him huge, huge alliance points with her. And it's a beautiful reframe of her behavior and with dignity, too. Son doesn't quite track all of it. He could then go, here's my reframe again to really make sure he understands it so he gets it. But that's not the goal of FFT, that they get some interpretation. So he's like, I'm just, he just goes to a different tack with it. But you heard the reframe, right? She did this for a good reason. You could say it was manipulative, but she is terrified by you, didn't know what to do. But she tried to take care of you then. Real, real powerful statement. Mom liked it. She's like, go ahead, take all the liberties you want. She felt really heard and understood right there. A lot of, there's a lot of movement already with her in terms of what you can get away with now in the therapy session. Let's say we're through tonight, okay. We're through tonight, that's we're through tonight. But if you all, here, there, or anywhere, are ever going to be able to make it together, and this may be the dumbest thing I can say, because maybe you're not invested in making it together. But if you are, this real tight cycle that you're in, I mean, it is so incredibly tight now that has to be just spread out. 
And every little part has to be legitimized. Mom and sister are with him. The kid is confused as hell. So he acknowledges him. She acted nurturance for the first time, nurturant for the first time ever in that session. Doesn't last. <laughs> Interruption. See how he doesn't fight him? It's like that's your outcome. That's but that's not where I'm at right now. He doesn't doesn't fight him. He goes to acknowledge you both have this. And to me, 
I'll be honest where it's acceptable to me. Or we don't live together. I'm saying I'm agreeing, but I'm saying something a little bit different. She doesn't see that <clears throat> when, I, when I go out and do things, she doesn't see that I'm doing it for myself and for a good cause of this. <clears throat> so that I'm doing keep Whoa. myself busy and have trouble. I go, I go, uh, there's always a reason why I'm out doing something. I, see I just wanted to highlight that piece. Jim had something he was saying to mom. Kid starts talking. Again, this is about them, not about you and your agenda. So he doesn't need to sell something to them right now. So he just tucked it away and he's going to come back to it later. But just note that because he will come back to it later. Um, it takes a while, but it's there. So kid starts talking. All that focus on pain, all that focus on their relationship, he just spontaneously comes here with it. Selectively attending to something positive. Yeah, they're not, they're not here. 
my mom's working and she's somewhere else doing something else. And my aunts and uncles and everybody in my family, they talk to me about, how are you doing in track? How are you doing with this? Why is everybody crying? I'm feeling this pain. I'm going to cry. You know, yeah. Okay. What's the pain? What's going on here? showing up and waiting and I know he does he's good you know and I miss a lot of that mm -hmm. not deliberately but it's because I'm tired but you know I, I work very hard and sometimes I complete my day's job like earlier in the day three four o'clock and I go home and all I want to do is like uh, survive mm -hmm. for the day mm -hmm. so when it gets to like especially really school season to <laughs> I don't I don't a lot of guilt because of that. Remember I said I wanted to stop you because I want to take a video of something about guilt? Yeah. And I may be, this may come across as I'm giving you my day way too much credit. But I want to do it. <laughs> yes. You are a person who is prone to guilt for any kind of reason. Okay. There might be cultural reasons. There are even arguments that our society does that to women and mothers. <laughs> we do that. And I say this as a male because we participate in that. We made it. And I'll lay that on you too. We give women an awful lot of responsibility and make them feel like basically they can never give enough. Okay? Now, if you've got a person who says, I come home, I work hard, I'm exhausted, I truly feel tired. Part of me wants to go watch my son, but another part of me wants to stay here and just go to sleep. Okay? Now, if I, and I, I feel like I've given all I can give. I'm tapped out. I'm through. I want to give you the money to enroll in the thing. I'm giving you. That's my support. If you ask me to also be there, okay, I don't come. I'm not there. But I feel guilty. And this is the important thing I want you to I feel very guilty. And all it takes is a couple of times to say, gee, you weren't even there to see me. And the guilt will go right through the roof. Always. I mean, that's a guaranteed thing you've got, just like that. Uh, yes. Okay, so we got the guilt. Now, I want to tie to this other thing. So she's got a part of her, not you, but a part of her, that say you're a bad mom. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is, then she has a whole list of things. <laughs> Okay, and she's always trying to say, am I, am I okay as a mom? Mm -hmm. All right, and what happens is, and this is where the tremendous pressure gets on you. If things aren't, if they seem at all out of control, if you shoplift, if you're gone too long, it might be as simple as you don't want to seem to be around the house as much as I think. Those are all have the potential of being proof to your mom that she's a bad mom. Do you follow the logic of that? Because this is powerful stuff. So this idea of control, part of it is yes, and this is where I'm kind of hearing you, Mom, but I'm also telling you there's more to it. Part of it is yes, she's worried about you, she loves you, and all the rest. But a part of it is her own thing. And we can blame her for that or not. But it's like as long as you're under control, I don't have to wake up every morning and every time you're late be thinking, he's screwing up or might be screwing up and that makes me a bad mom. Do, do you follow that link? So this incredible control you feel is her just trying to feel like, I don't need to cry right now, so stop it. <laughs> it's this, this desperate lady. Now, I'm not saying that makes what she does right. But I'm saying until you too, because there's a version of this for you too, because that's not your problem. Your problem is not to make your mom feel good about herself. And that's what she's laid on you. Well, you can call it guilt or whatever. 
Although you may have felt the same way. Who I am? Hmm? Who I am? Who I am? Oh, well, I, I don't know. You probably can answer that better than I could. There are a whole bunch of reasons. There are just a whole bunch of reasons. And it could be as simple as, this is my last one. So remember, remember, it all started through control. I can't get him to do what I want him to do. I can't instill values. And this comes from mom feeling like she's a rotten mom and her wanting to do whatever possible for him. It was just a beautiful reframe. It took an entire session to deliver it, but it involved all that acknowledgement, that stroking, that staying with them, never once coming up hierarchical, one up to saying, here's what we're going to try to accomplish, letting their story kind of emerge. But you already knew. Remember, we said, track that. He's going to come back to it. He already had that reframe ready about 20 minutes ago. But he let them wallow in the emotion that had come up rather than try to force it. Because that emotion is OK. That negative emotion is an all right place for them to be because you can control it. If you sweeten it up, I, I, with the therapists that I work with, when they, they get nervous when they start seeing pain come up. And I say, you know, you led the horse to water. Why are you serving it Coke? <laughs> you know, let him drink the water. Let him kind of wallow in that for a little while. You don't need to sweeten it up. And he let them wallow for a little bit, but he brought it back because he wanted to have the son experience mom in a different way. And she asked, why him? Typically, this doesn't happen, but I'm going to let it play out because it's pretty powerful. Um, but this is not what we're always looking for. These are kind of these rare events that suddenly emerge with the backgrounds of trauma that we don't necessarily know. We knew she was depressed, um, but we didn't know this story. Um, so I'll just let, you, let it play for a few minutes and we'll stop for questions. Um, and then one thing, when I no longer have to face that as a parent, I might be free. They're ready to come back for the next session, by the way. So session's done. I could stop it there and have met the goals. It could be as simple as that. On the other hand, the last one is the, kind of the way to make it right. Yeah. Your dad wasn't around. And I was the oldest in the family. That kind of has a lot of older men and sisters that they have to hate in that. I was given the responsibility of being a parent to uh, have a household, I guess. I would think I would bring them in. You've got my own dad and my. I just 
and come in and complain of parent that I was so burnt out. I had that experience since you can uh, mm -hmm. I mean, she can. She's really wants to retire. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to retire. He, uh, nine years old, cystic fibrosis, dad goes out partying, she um, takes a shower, washes her long hair, spreads it out on the pillow, he comes in at night not feeling well and said, can I sleep with you? She's like, I don't want you on the same pillow with me because my hair is drying and you'll mess it up, sleep at the foot of the bed. He slept at the foot of the bed and died right on her legs that night and she's carrying that for a long, long time. You don't see that drama unfold a lot in the sessions. It's not the goal of FFT, but given the, con you know, the session, it's so clear in terms of the reframe and the progression. That's why I like to show it. You can see a full session rather than a technique because these things don't just occur in a single statement. They occur over an entire process. So you get a sense of how that unfolds. And it doesn't have to end with all that drama. It just did for her at that point. Um, but you get those that, that occur. Getting emotion in the session is common, that level of depth, not all the time. Um, different experience of that mom now versus when she's like, I stabilize situations, <laughs> right? I don't want to be a mom anymore. I'm, I'm sick of him. He needs somebody to pound him over the head and knock some sense in. This is a mom who cares tremendously for this kid, loves him tremendously. And it's very easy to get trapped early into telling her to stop that toxic behavior and all you'll do is push her away. But by acknowledging her and tracking her and really being there with her and giving her a lot of credit, she was willing to say, you know what, I don't feel like a very good mom. She owned that part of it. She's struggling. She's feeling hopeless and desperate. That's why they're in therapy. If she had all the answers and was doing it, she'd have been doing it already because she cares about it. She took tremendous risks there. And I felt she did that because of all that acknowledgement and the respect-based and relational statements and the reframes that were done. It doesn't occur in a single comment, but it, it unfolds over the session. That makes sense, guys? You kind of see how it kind of works and how this comes together? I'm sorry I, I didn't really, we don't have time in a, in a three hour workshop to actually break down the techniques with more detail, but I wanted you to see it rather than just simply talk about it. Are there questions? You know, it's a good question, um, and it's one we're very cautious about. So we don't break things off in individual sessions as functional family therapists. But absolutely, if we feel there's something that a family member can benefit by having corollary services, we'll fold those into treatment. But we tend to do those at the end of services rather than in the middle of it. And so we will bring them in at the very earliest, early in behavior change, which is about three or four sessions into treatment but we're not gonna start with that. Um, we'll actually get them motivated first. Um, so all of our early work is conjoint. And it's hard, it's, it's tough sledding. When you got some serious psychopathology, you gotta work your butt off. Yeah. Yeah. There was a, yeah. I just have a question about, as a therapist, how would you interact with this sister? I, mean, <laughs> I told you one of you could ask it. I <laughs> it <laughs> It's the elephant in the room. Yeah, because yeah. she's just she's sitting there, and it, I feel like she's totally being ignored. And then, but you yeah. know, she's occupying herself clearly, and yeah. it's tearful. She, oh, she, oh, she's fully engaged. Yeah. There, it would have been very easy to, to just look at her and go, "Sorry, I'm not talking as much to you, right. but I was really worried about your mom being lost, and I, I don't mean any disrespect." And go right on with the rest of it. Yeah. He just didn't do it. Yeah. Uh, if I'm supervising Jim, I would tell him, "For the God's <laughs> sakes, throw the girl one statement." Uh, is it that hard? <laughs> Did she become more involved in the session or in there? 
Oh, she's involved in all the other ones and the rest of it. But remember that the white heat, you know, that part of the, the fire that's the hottest was mom and the son. And it really was mom. And that's all Jim cared about in that session is, you know what, I'm not the therapist here, but I want them back for the next session. And so he came in with that sole purpose. So sister in his mind was really secondary. Um, and so when you talk about family models, other family models are like, well, how can you do this work unless you're all triadic and systemic? FFT is very pragmatic. Um, we're just like, this is the issue. This is what we're going to accomplish. We're going to get in there and get it done. Um, a lot of our managed care therapists hate us because I'll tell them things like, you know what? If you get your job accomplished in 20 minutes, get the hell out of the room before you undo it. Um, or make sure you plan for things that take 40 minutes um, or 45 minutes so you can get paid for it. Because if you design a behavior change intervention and you get in there and get them to accomplish it, and then what are you gonna do? Sit there and, and drag your feet for the next 25 minutes? I want to just get in, get it done, and get out. And if you think you can accomplish two skills with a the family, then have two skills ready. But don't wing it. Never wing it. You gotta be prepared. So it's the same thing here, it's pragmatic. Sister wasn't a problem. He should have acknowledged her, absolutely. He didn't. It's a problem with the session. I still haven't seen a perfect session in any model by any therapist. Yeah. So I have a question. Yeah, sort of relates to this video, but I work in a partial hospital program. Yeah. So typically we get two sessions for family for a discharge after their outpatient provider period. Yeah. And sometimes we'll get to the point, like in this video, where we have that sort of emotion, and then we're like, okay, well, um, good luck. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and then so I don't know if that's maybe the best way to approach it, or if I should be able to more pragmatic about things and not let it get to that point and then we'll put it yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question, but it's a great question. Um, it depends on what your goals are. You know, if your goal is to try to create family bonding experiences and have this be a part of their, of, of the patient's ability in the, in the unit now to process those emotions, to work them through, and to kind of talk about what those triggers are in their own individual sessions and other things, that's a different story. It doesn't kind of help that system, though. Not in any kind of direct way. You can hope that some of the stuff that gets done now and locked in gets generalized into the family after the kid comes back out again. But you'd like to see kind of more of that. But that's, that's a challenge of doing that work. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of the residential programs have been tricky because the long-term outcomes aren't as good. They're great for short term, but longer term, within two or three months, if, you know, a lot of kids end up relapsing because they go right back to the same system again. And so if you're able to kind of lock some of that stuff in, it's great. Um, and I don't know the answer. I used to do that, those kind of family sessions also in a, a substance abuse unit, and they were powerful as all get out. Everyone was crying. Therapists are crying. The techs are crying. The families are crying. And, uh, and, they, and they leave, and then they're back again a month later. Uh, but none of that family level change occurs. Um, I'd like, I wish there was just more of it. So what we try to do is, is piggyback our services onto the seam when they are leaving the facility. And so we think of our model as an outpatient approach rather than something you try to integrate while they're in treatment in an inpatient facility. And then not use up too, many, too much of our services, but make sure we actually have it a seam. There's no seam between when they're leaving and when we pick it up to help that process. Because good change does occur. In the, in the hospital context, how can you sustain that? And so we try to do that way when the kids are being re-entered back into the family. Not an easy answer to that one. That's a reality of the way a lot of the programs are set up. You have these real intense like family drama, psychodrama stuff, they're, they're powerful, um, but they don't really create a, a lasting change. It's like the encounter movements for those who are a little older, the encounter movements of the 70s and 80s, beautiful where people come together for a weekend, no lasting change. There's a question here too, or are you just again, Okay, don't put your elbow on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I know this will probably differ by family, but in general, how do you approach separated families? Um, I was going to come up with a smart-ass comment, and I, and I couldn't come up with one. Um, so, okay, th that is a complicated question. It does vary by family. If you have a separated family that has a lot of contact, they have shared family dinners. Um, parents are talking regularly. There are times where they come together around soccer games or around a ballet, or they're, they're, you know, they're together and involved. I'm much more inclined to have joint sessions where both parents are together. 
if they don't share their lives that way and they operate as two independent and separate households, it's unrealistic for us to think that family therapy should actually be pushing them together for something that doesn't exist. Um, if they're separated households but the parents are working together, that's a different scenario than separated households where there's high conflict. Um, high conflict stuff has to be addressed. And it can be addressed through working with family unit A and family unit B separately and blocking every time mom starts to get beat up on by dad and dad's beaten up on, uh, on mom. Um, so just block all of those so the kids don't get exposed to it. And sometimes we'll even have a telephone call where we have both of them on the line talking about joint goals. And it can be pretty direct um, once you're moving into behavior change around what is and is not acceptable around parenting. We may be all nice during motivation, but in behavior change, we are very directive. Um, and we give a lot of instructions about what to do. So we look very different later in treatment than we are early in treatment. Does that answer it some? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Our is yeah. Constantly Everything you just saw here of, is what we'll be doing. This is where, where it's all going to be about. But this is not involved, right? he, we won't. It'll be about mom and her. Yeah, dad won't be in those sessions um, at all. And uh, content-wise, there'll be a lot of reframing around what that means mm -hmm. in terms of who she is, what buttons are getting pushed for her and mom. This can be the same process you just saw here. We'll follow in that kind of session to figure out what it is. Conflict is always a good thing because if you think of a pendulum, the higher the level of conflict gives you a sense of how far the other side feels. So you know there's that level of intense positive emotion on the other side of it. It's when you're not getting any of that that there's a problem. So when I hear that level of negativity, it doesn't bother me because I'll trust this process to get me to the place where she's able to see mom in a very different way. If she doesn't give me that, it's much more, it's much more challenging. Yeah. Yeah, and this girl doesn't want to stick her head out. And she doesn't want to stick her head out for whom? The person she loves and cares about the most in the world. She doesn't want to get it chopped off by that person. And so that's where you start working. Yeah. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, there was a question before you. Sorry, oh, you guys are piggybacking all over the place. Can he piggyback for one more minute and then you, you know, you used to get on a whole horse, different horse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I need to go with them. Everything would be better. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, then you have conversations with the parents about, you know what, guys, what are the goals here? What do you guys want to support or not support? And it's just very direct around what good parenting looks like in divorced households. Would you have the child be part of that conversation? No. No, not on that telephone call. No, I wouldn't. Um, just tend not to. Those, those conversations don't occur very often. And I'm talking about things during behavior change here. During motivation, I'm going to have the kid with the dad in a session. I'm going to have kid with mom in a session because that's how they're living. The content that might come up could be, well, I'm just going to go to dad's and all the rest of it, but I'm going to deal with that in that session. And I'm not going to scapegoat the, the parent who's not there. We're going to come back to kind of this unit here. Okay, that answer it? Yeah, um, yeah. so with foster kids, we will work with per permanent foster families, but if it's a foster family that's transient, we don't work with them. Um, there are other models that are better than FFT for that, like uh, the Patty Chamberlain's trauma, uh, tr uh, the Oregon model of uh, TFCO. Um, that one's a much better treatment foster care, Oregon. Great model. Um, if it's a permanency placement, we just do FFT with them because they have a past and they have a history that's going to be shared together. And we try to create those links and those bonds in a way that's relational, uh, that builds hope, reduces blame and negativity, and builds balance alliances. So the same things during motivation you're going to see with those families. So when a parent says something like, we adopted the wrong effing kids, we got rejects, 
you got to deal with that just like you would a parent saying that kind of thing. Yeah. Sometimes we have this, uh, um, might be flawed thinking, but it could be accurate, that foster families may care less about those kids. Um, and I tend to think that that often is flawed because I think that this mom doesn't look all that much different from the mom I was telling you guys about LA saying my kid lacks that human thing and, and doesn't look that much different from the foster family that made that comment. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've done sessions with uh, divorced families um, where we bring them all together. Um, and you've got the parents, you've got their new spouses, and you've got all the other siblings. Um, and I've done that in different languages. Really? And yeah, I did in Sweden, they all, they all got their little strollers, they're pushing them around, and, and yeah, and they're fantastic, but they're all there doing the work together. And it's, it's amazing, because most of that fight is not about being good parents, because just culturally, they're all in it. Um, it's pretty remarkable. You go out on the street in Sweden, you're likely to see men walking, pushing the stroller as much as you are women walking around pushing the strollers. It's great. Um, I didn't even say that. Uh, never mind. I didn't say anything about Sweden. Um, it's nothing but problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I've never had a kid hit their 18th birthday and then stop therapy on that day. It's done. Sorry. Bye bye. Because if they don't want to be involved in therapy, it doesn't matter if they're 13, 14, 15, or 16, or 17, or 18. They're not going to be involved in therapy. Um, 18 is some kind of. It, it has some myth in our culture that it means something powerful around them now being emancipated. And I'll tell you, I've seen beautifully emancipated 16-year-olds and. 23-year-olds that, you know, can barely even get to the bathroom on their own. Um, you know, so it, 18 means very little. Um, so it, it, yeah. They actually have kind of the right to say, I don't want to participate. They always do. Yeah, they always do. Um, it's our job to make it worth their while. Kid who doesn't talk. Um, yeah, you got me here, but I'm not going to say a damn word. How do you be strength-based in relation to that one? You could say to them, you know what, if you just talk, this would be easier, easier. Otherwise, we're going to be here for 30 sessions. You talk to me, it's going to be 12. You just gave away your power. To say, you know what, I appreciate you're not talking rather than coming here and saying this is all bullshit. Other kids come in here and say it's bullshit. You show a little bit more respect. Yeah. <laughs> Makes you pissed, Mom, but at least you're showing some respect. That kid is going to take a step back and go, oh, I don't know what to make of this person. And they're kind of full of shit still, but <laughs> boy, they didn't call me on it, did they? <laughs> yeah. So we're a little over. Thank you so much for your attention. It's a long conference for you guys. Good luck for everything. Yeah. Good luck, guys.